Susanna and Michael and Anita. Good morning. Good morning, Revolution. And Scott. Hi, Revolution. All right. Hello, well, I'm also Scott. here. <laughs> I see you got your hat on, uh, Scott, your, your, your mountain climbing hat. Yeah, I need a haircut. Um, just getting too voluminous. <laughs> well, I, I got a solution for you, man. You know, <laughs> yeah, that takes even more time. I don't have the energy to be bald, Joe. Play that thing off and uh, <laughs> let the air flow. <laughs> there we go. It's crazy, I'm telling you. <laughs> we, got a, we got a great show for you uh, this morning. We're going to talk briefly about uh, Black History Month. And then we, we, we have some... Um, Good information uh, with respect to our national committee meeting. The uh, truckers are, are coming to town, coming to a town near you. So get ready for the good old boy revolt. And then last not but not least, we're going to revisit uh, Mr. Biden selling wolf tickets. That's what we used to call it back at home when you were threatening somebody to Mr. Putin over the uh, Ukraine standoff. So um, let's get started. Um, happy Black History Month. And uh, we have a lot of uh, stories that are gonna be coming up on cpusa.org. Uh, one on Herschel Walker, who was a party leader in Missouri, written by Tony Pesanowski. And then we have another uh, about Elsie Dickerson. Elsie was the chairperson of the party in Eastern Pennsylvania. She died, oh, maybe 10 years ago or so. Wonderful, wonderful comrade. Uh, and that was done, uh, written by uh, Rookie Perna in Eastern Pennsylvania. And, uh, and then we have several uh, others. So um, stay tuned for it. I think we're gonna have one about coming out of Ohio. No, Anita? Yes, on Langston Hughes, who is who's on Bowen gave us the inspiration for the gave you the inspiration for the name of the show that we have here good morning revolution langston hughes went to uh uh high school in cleveland um so that's the ohio connection there so uh, we'll have something coming out of ohio on langston hughes oh wonderful will it be like a little bio uh, biography exactly uh-huh uh -huh. i love langston hughes poetry um I read a couple of his like autobiographies, I Wonder As I Wander. Uh, and then he, you know, one of his uh, favorite uh, uh, pieces of writing was uh, about a character named Simple. Did you ever read uh, his oh, story yeah. about Simple, huh? I think I know those stories, isn't it? He, he, he seems simple, but really has some wisdom to impart that is, isn't that the uh, crux of it? Don't we all? Refresh <laughs> my memory. I don't know. <laughs> yes, yeah, I think I think that 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 uh, that uh, gets it. Uh, so, in any event, uh, a happy Black History Month. Uh, please check out our website, cpusa.org, and the People's World for ongoing uh, coverage. And and then we have a number of Black History Month events coming up. Uh, Michael, I believe one on Sunday. Uh, about uh, African American youth. Seven o'clock. I'm sorry. That's at seven o'clock Eastern. Seven o'clock Eastern, um, and then uh, a week from Sunday, we're having a uh, meeting on police violence and murder. Mm -hmm. We'll uh, deal with the recent killing in uh, uh, Minneapolis and the need for uh, community control. Uh, of the police. So uh, stay tuned for those two big events. Speaking of big events, we had the party's national committee meeting uh, last Sunday and uh, uh, followed by a uh, national meeting of party members uh, on Wednesday. Uh, 500 some people showed up uh, uh, for that, for that nationwide uh, meeting representing clubs and districts all over the country. Rosanna, you happy with the NC and the um, uh, membership meeting? I'm very happy and, and I'm even more happy because we've gotten quite a few responses of you know, people being happy about it. They, you know, and that's the most important thing is that 
that uh, you know we're the voice of the membership and uh, and what's happening in our country. You know that it reflects what the the needs of of what's happening in our country and what's the next move, what's our next uh, work and ahead, uh, things like that. So it's mm -hmm. good, very good. Rosanna, uh, or or Joe, uh, maybe for for people who might not be familiar with the different leadership bodies of our party. Um, could you talk a little bit about what the the role of the NC, what it um, what it does? Policy. Mm -hmm. NC makes the policy. It's the it's the uh, uh, highest uh, decision making body of the party. It's elected every four years uh, at our national conventions, and it has the task of overseeing in broad strokes. Uh, the uh, work that the party does, the political, organizational, and, uh, and educational uh, work. Um, it's a body of about 52 people. And uh, we try to make sure that it's representative of, uh, uh, in the first place, the working class, you know, and uh, its composition. We, we, we really believe in working class leadership, <laughs> uh, especially at the top leader top levels of the uh, party, try to make sure it's representative of men and women equally and uh, black, white, Latino, gay, straight, and so on and so forth. But it's, uh, and its function is mainly a political and uh, ideological. If I've understood correctly, it stands in for the convention. The convention is the highest policy mod making body of the party, but in between the convention periods, the national committee sort of stands in for that uh, to oversee the work decided on by the convention, or yeah, absolutely, that's that's its function. You know, you can't uh, some organizations. NAACP has a convention every year. They bring two, three thousand <laughs> people together. I don't know how they do it. That's too exhausting. That last one was it was great, but it was hard. It was a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So you know, uh, every every, uh, but you want to involve people, the membership, and uh, at the basic club level, the district level in the decision-making of the party, uh, Anita. And uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's, so Anita, what was the basic thing that struck you about the National Committee? Anything that st uh, stood out? Well, for me, it was really re resolving this issue that we talk about um, all the time about the, the, the sort of fine line we walk really uh, fighting fascism in this country. And I think we have to take the fascist threat uh, seriously. We're going to be talking about the truckers strike uh, in a in a, or action, whatever it is. It's uh, uh, not a protest, but we'll talk about that. But it, that's a you know part a piece of of the movement of the right wing forces in our country, and I think we really have to address that. And at the same time, we have to be um, you know lend our critical support or criticize when necessary the. Um, both uh, political parties, um, but we have to, I really think, defend against this idea that the parties are exactly alike and it doesn't matter who you vote for. It really does matter who you vote for. And I think, I think women in particular know that is true, um, that, that we wouldn't have Amy Coney Barrett, you know, uh, Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court if, if, if you know, if we didn't have that, uh, the, the results of the 2016 election. So I think we really do recognize some differences and some ability of the working class to influence um, some uh, political elites um, more than others. So I think it, it, I think that you know bringing that 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 problem and that issue really to the fore and talking it out I think was really enlightening for the membership and my. The membership in Ohio was really excited about the whole process and the whole on um, the whole membership meeting, and they want to have follow up membership meetings in Ohio and in their clubs to talk about the same issues. Michael, there were a lot of questions about the Democratic Party at the membership meeting. Why are you got the Democrats and the Republicans are the same? They're both fascist, and uh, <clears throat> isn't the Popular Front? Somebody said, uh, basically, what that, doesn't that mean tailing the Democratic Party? Uh, well, vote against fascism nonsense. Yeah. I mean, come on, how can you 
you can't vote fascism out. I mean, I mean, fascists are fascists, and you know what fascists do. Exactly. If we were in the place, you know, if we had the capacity and if the uh, election electoral laws across the country uh, would put us in a position to be able to have, you know, 20, 40 senators <laughs> in the Senate and, you know, 300 members in, in, in the House, that'd be great, you know, but that's not where things are right now. So we have to work with what we have. And that means, you know, um, as you said, casting the widest net uh, to catch these sharks, you know, and so that means working with uh, people like Stacey Abrams, who's out there registering millions of people um, uh, to vote. And they got, you know, Warnock and Ossoff elected and whatever their flaws may be, certainly they're better than, you know, the Ted Cruz's who are out there, you know, trying to outlaw abortion and trying to, um, you know, suppress uh, black and brown workers from, from uh, voting and trying to keep transgender people out of bathrooms, you know, that, so they aren't the same. We can sit around and talk about how bad, you know, liberals are, you know, in, in certain cases, especially with foreign policy. I think we can all agree right now with what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. The Biden administration is making a serious mistake. And even on domestic policy, they could be much better. But, you know, you have to work with what you have. If we were in a country like Chile, where the Communist Party is in a position to kind of like lead a coalition like they did in their most recent elections with Gabriel Boric, you know, and the center kind of followed along, of course we would do that. And we fight for that, as you said, we fight for working class leadership, communist party leadership, but we can't be afraid to work in coalitions with these independent forces, uh, like unions, like these progressive NGOs and so forth, uh, like the poor people's campaign um, to, to ultimately defeat the fascist danger on all fronts. Well, son, if somebody said, do you trust Joe Biden? Do you, Rosanna? I mean <laughs> Well, I trust him as far as I could, I could throw him, but <laughs> I, I, that's not the, the thing is, that's not the point about trust or not trust. It's what you have to work with. You know, it's like the, the, the you know, if you're playing cards, the deck you have is what you're going to start with. How are you going to maneuver it? How, which, you know, which card you're going to put down strategically down before to, to get to where you want to go. And I think that that's what what we have to um, internalize as Marxists is what do you have to work with and how is that going to move everything in, a, in, in the direction that you want to go, even if it's just one more step towards it. And that's how we look at things. What's that next step that we need to move things forward to, to, you know, towards our goal? And, and um, that's how it's important to, to look at it that way instead of personalities or anything like that because then you lose sight and you lose you lose touch of the working class and you lose touch of uh, what you want to do because then you become disconnected ruling class only understands one thing power mm -hmm. <laughs> relationships of power speaking of which scott what's the difference between popular front and tailing the Democratic Party. I mean, isn't the popular front basically tailing? No, there's a, I think there's a clear difference. And it's a, there's a difference that um, I think on occasions I have heard people missing, uh, but the popular front is um, a coalition of all the forces willing to uh, work for democracy. Um, for a popular front to be effective, it has to be under working class leadership. The working class has to play the major role in getting it together, has to put their imprint on it, as Lenin says. And that's what we saw in the 1930s. The, um, the world communist movement was strong. Um, union, uh, unions were growing, labor was, was growing in strength and militancy. And when the, the time to step into the fight against fascism came, um, the working class found itself in a leading role. Um, certainly, uh, in in most countries in in Europe, um, but also um, here in the United States, in in uh, setting up setting the, the the tone of the Popular Front. Um, uh, tailing the Democratic Party is something very different, where you know we just say, oh, you know. We, we, we don't have the strength to go it alone, so we're just going to throw in our lot with the Democratic Party. We concede leadership to these other forces. No, the role, the, the, the task of building a popular front um, starts with the working class, and it includes forces from other classes, but it's 
the, the organization, the drive, the democratic impetus of it uh, has to come from uh, the working class and its allies. That's the difference I would see. You know, I was preparing for a class of the party in Southern California a couple of weeks ago. So I reread all of the documents from Lenin and the Third International. And I, I, I draw a new conclusion, Scott, that Lenin was the uh, past master of popular front. They employed the Popular Front from 1903 through the revolution. Oh, certainly. I mean, um, for me, two, two tactics is the uh, theoretical framework of Popular Front thinking. That's like, what I'm talking about. The point about. That, that the, only the working class can carry the fight for democracy all the way. Only the working class can be its backbone. And so uh, the working class has to fight to put its mark on the movement for democracy not take it over, not be the only force, but it has to be in there. There are dangers. There are dangers. We, we, we ended up with Browder, mm -hmm. who was the leader of the party's popular front efforts. And he ended up dissolving the party. But, but, but what happens is that they liquid, they dissolved the shop clubs, they got off on this crazy, you know, we're in a new period of cooperation. They took the eye off the working class, Rosanna, and working class leadership. So there are dangers, but the question is, what is the alternative? You know, come up with a, so all you Marxists, Leninists, staunch communists, of which I'm one, when you criticize the popular front, you're criticizing Lenin. Don't act like you're somebody else. Act like you know. Anyway, Rosanna, we raised, uh, $13,000 last week for the PW fund drive, uh, $7,000 at the NC meeting, and another $6,000 on, uh, on Wednesday. So we're off to a good start. Yes, we are. We're off to a good, we got to raise almost $100,000 by May Day, Michael. So, uh, and, uh, this isn't and I know I don't, I want to hear how much your club uptown is going to raise. And Anita, I want to know how much our district is going to raise. And uh, in the course of it, we also decided at the NC, we're going to raise a little hell between now and uh, June 18th. And we're going to DC. We're going to DC on the 18th. We're going to have a big contingent at the Poor People's March. So, so, so get ready. Um, truckers are coming to town. What the heck? Can't they keep them up in Canada? Poor, our poor Canadian comrades. <laughs> well, they're coming a little too late. The mandates are being lifted, even here in California. Mm. <clears throat> they're coming a little too late. I think that's just the disguise. I think I've been oh, listening I agree. to some I agree. of their, they've been on a Steve Bannon all this week, his little radio podcast show. And, you know, the, they say the man that, you know, they want to fight for freedom is kind of make America great, you know, right wing populist rhetoric. And so I think what we saw in Canada is just, just a, a, an appetizer for what they have planned. And what Joe, connecting Joe's last point to, you know, they're, they're coming to DC. I think they're leaving on the 23rd and then they should be there by the beginning of, of March or so. And they claim to have a thousand trucks, you know, and they're coming to DC. They're calling it the People's Convoy. They have a little song on their website and all this goofy stuff. But I think the best way to counter that uh, as a party and as a working class, I think is to have in June, you know, 500 comrades there in DC and be there with the masses of people saying, no, this is, this is what democracy looks like. You know, not this um, January 6th, um, don't tread on me, you know, right wing look, you know, that's not gonna bring freedom. And notice that, you know, they weren't, go, they weren't leading these protests when Trump was in office. You know, they're choosing their time and, 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 their, and their tactics uh, wisely, I guess. And, you know, and I think um, the language that they're using, we've talked on this show before about this kind of like, uh, it appears to be left wing, but it's actually right wing, you know, rhetoric. They're very wise and, and, and using all these dog whistles and so forth. And so keep an eye on it and keep an eye on the working class because these are not your, your average truck drivers. These are not your teamsters. These are not your, you know, and so, these are independent, 
owner. Exactly. Exactly. And the these, towns these that they're are, driving are small through. business owners. Exactly. And the uh, towns that they're driving right through, they're st strategically choosing the towns that they're driving through to work with uh, local law enforcement, you know, which which groups of law enforcement will let them through. And so the communities really have to go out and say, you know, we're not going to let you drive through here with your swastikas and your Confederate flags and so forth, you know. So we'll see. It's going to take a it's going to take a people's front, not just voting, but you know, out there in the streets demonstrating, locking arms, having I a block party. Some arm. people were were setting up roadblocks. People in different small towns they put brought out their bicycles, rode Rosanna, and uh, and uh, cars and and uh, hay and and they formed a human chain across the highway and said, yeah. yeah Y'all ain't coming through here. And I know they, in Mexico, uh, they put rocks, big nice. boulders on the street. So you definitely cannot, you know, you can run over people or, you know, push people aside. But those big rocks, you can't, you know, you can't uh, drive over. So, you know, and it works. <laughs> it shall not pass. <laughs> exactly. It shall, but this is why we need a movement of the people. We need to overcome, we need to work together with all of the people's forces, churches, unions, uh, synagogues, mosques, civic association, PTAs, to regenerate uh, a movement uh, over the course of the next civil rights, uh, over the next uh, several months up to the election. And one of the things that the NC uh, said, Scott and Anita, is that we need to fight voter suppression. That was one of the big conclusions of our meeting. And their voter, 34 different states, they're trying to suppress the vote. And it's really important for us to get involved in those struggles. I hope people are listening. I hope people reach out to, you know, the different organizations that in Florida and Texas and Ohio. Um, and it's not just an issue for the red states or the swing states. You know, it's an issue for the, the so-called safe states. In fact, there's no such thing as safe states. What is a safe state? You know, Pataki got elected governor in New York. Then then, then we had Giuliani, crazy Giuliani. <laughs> then we have Bloomberg. And, and now there's Eric Adams. I mean, and well, Eric is not as, but he's kind of a conservative Democrat, you know? So there's no place that's safe. Anyway, let's move the agenda. Questions from our listening audience. Um, we got several. Let's see. What's our position on anarchism? Anybody? Uh, against. We, huh? Against. We're against anarchism. Why? Because, look, one can't simply sort of conjure away. The problem is not power. The problem is that the power is held by the capitalist class. Um, and we need to be able to break the power of the capitalist class. And that doesn't happen spontaneously. It doesn't happen, you know, in, in small, autonomous, self-organized, whatever. It requires the working class holding state power and using it to strip power um, away from its, from its enemy in order, to, in order to do the work of liberation. That's, you know, that, that's just kind of a basic of Marxism. But we work with people who are anarchists on the is issues, no, Anita? I mean, oh, sure. Like, you know, I've you know been out with people from Food Not Bombs and and all sorts of groups that identify more on the the anarchist wing. But um, that's not that's not our position. That's not our strategy on the issue of the state. Yeah, they want to abolish the state. We say we need a working class led state because capitalists are going to fight back hard. And we converge in the end, right? We want, the we want to get rid of the state too, eventually, but it has a purpose. 
and it has a it has a lifespan. Um, that's a long that's a long road to uh, uh, get there. So, uh, Anita, does that mean that we are, we're, we're not a what about abolish the prisons? I saw you guys holding up signs during the uprising, abolish the prisons. Isn't that an anarchist position? Well, it's a position. We we uh, it's a principle. We we do um we do recognize that prisons are just um a, a, a negative for for society and something that we should be fighting uh, to abolish eventually. I mean, I think prisons, the prison uh, situation in the United States is just a, a, an abomination, um, you know, that we are the, the most imprisoning, the most uh, freedom um, removing uh, country in the world. Um, I think it's, it's despicable and, and only, it only uh, increases disorder in society because for instance, all the gangs uh, that that uh, consolidated in federal prison in the 1990s became national, and, and thanks to uh, the federal prison system. So I think it, it just has a really negative effect on society. It it leaves families with without their loved ones, without their breadwinners. It it's just a, a you know children without parents. It's uh, just negative up and down. Um, I think we. We need alternatives uh, to that um, that are community-based alternatives and you know keep us all safe. It's not the answer to the problem at all. And I think that it's been proven time and time again that it's just not the answer. And I know the people worry about well, what's you know, what are you gonna do with the criminals and and all of these, you know, these crimes are being committed. There are answers, but prisons are just not the answer. There's the worst true criminals aren't in prison anyway, and they true, don't get sent there. True rehabilitation, and uh, you know, there's true, there's truth to having a livable wage. There's truth to being treated like a human being. That really makes uh, a good positive change. What are you going to do with Trump, Michael? If you don't put him in prison. Room in space. Well, I, I think, got some ideas. Yeah, people, people, when we make claims such as, you know, we want socialism, we want to abolish prisons, we want to abolish the police, we don't mean like right now. We understand that it's a process. Rosanna always says the class struggle is more of a marathon than a sprint, you know? Of course, we want revolution and stuff, but even like in the case of Cuba, when you're uh, building socialism, it's a process. It's not the day after you know, the triumph over Batista, you know, it's a socialist system, you know what I mean? And so we're against, of course, the prison industrial complex and the institution of police as they exist right now, or that doesn't mean we're not for taking care of our communities. You know, we want community control of the police. We eventually are going to need, you know, community watches and so forth, you know, and so we understand that it's a process. It's not going to happen overnight. And I think that's going back to the question on anarchism. That's kind of the um, the difference, you know, we have a plan to get there. We don't have all the answers, but I think that our party program really does a good job of kind of explaining uh, what's needed to get to that point, uh, to change all these different institutions and so forth in the United States. And you have the last word. Have a great week, everybody. Stay strong, stay safe, stay in the fight, support the People's World Fund Drive. Uh, and uh, come to our program on Sunday night at eight o'clock. You can go to cpusa.org uh, and uh, find the uh, link. Uh, and uh, Monday's President's Day. So if you celebrate that kind of thing, have a good day off. <laughs> we'll see you back here. I celebrated. Uh, uh, we'll be back here on Mon uh, Friday, same time, same station. Have a great <laughs> week, everybody. Bye. Bye, comrades.